The Best of the Best in Horror Countdown looks at the best horror films released between October 1st, 2019 through September 30th, 2020. We've got a pair of John Carpenter themed picks today. Here we go. Welcome to the official Best of Horror 2019-2020 Countdown on M.L. Miller Frights, a part of the Kings of Horror Network. I'm M.L. Miller. Be sure to give this video a like, share with your buddies across the electronic superhighway, click subscribe to this channel, and don't forget to ring that bell for notifications. If you're in the Chicago area and love horror, you don't have any excuse not to head out to the Chi-Town Movies Drive-In for the Music Box of Horrors. Every day in October, for 31 nights, there will be late shows, Sunday through Thursday, and double features on Friday through Saturday. Every weekend is themed, Grindhouse Fridays, Rip-Off Saturdays, and Sequel Sundays. Tonight, they've got an awesome double feature, starting with the director's cut of Nightbreed, followed by Death by Temptation. Look below for a link to the schedule, where to get tickets, and directions to this awesome horror event. Number 23 is Blood Machines, released on May 21st, 2020. Blood Machines is streaming exclusively on Shudder, and it was directed by Seth Eicherman and written by Eicherman and Paul Lafarge. While I'm usually attracted to deeper things like compelling storytelling, nuanced acting, and insightful themes, I'm not too proud to say that if a film simply looks, sounds, and oozes cool, I'll let it have its way with me. I'm hoary that way. Blood Machines is a CG-heavy sci-fi horror adventure with bone-shaking music and imagery out of a futurist's worst nightmare. It's a three-part series, with each installment clocking in at about 15 minutes or so, making the entire series' runtime about 50 minutes and change. So while it doesn't exactly constitute as a film, it's damn near close if you want to watch them all in a row. A spaceship piloted by a pair of humanoids, Baskin, Anders Henriksen, who doesn't really respect anything or anyone, especially machines, and Lago, Christian Erikson, who has a strong bond with the ship's female-shaped computer named Mima. This spaceship shoots down an unmanned vehicle that crashes onto a nearby planet. From the wreckage, a spirit in the form of a woman emerges. This event is seen as some kind of miracle by the locals, a tribe of women warriors with strong beliefs in the connection between spirit and machine, led by the tough-as-nails Corey, played by Elisa Lasowski. As the spirit floats into the atmosphere, the ship, with Corey as hostage, makes chase, but the spacemen have no idea what it is they're chasing down. Slow-mo moves, dazzling strobes, vibrant colors, and sumptuous shapes, paired with the electronic hammer beats of, of the band Carpenter Brute, make Blood Machines, a film that is unlike anything you will ever see or hear before. Blood Machines feels like the product of an all-night orgy between Clive Barker's Hellraiser, Richard Stanley's Hardware, Panos Cosmatos' Beyond the Black Rainbow, Cronenbergian Body Horror, Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Tron diving in for sloppy seconds. All set to the tune of a dark synth-based sounds of a hard-edged Daft Punk concert. It's as hypnotic as it is beautiful, with multicolored lights sparkling and glistening off these gritty and time-worn machines. Director Seth Eicherson has a vision that is truly original and awe-inspiring, as he pairs the destruction and deterioration of machine and metal with vivid and mind-numbing luminescence of the spirit. Plus, he doesn't forget to make these surreal images with soft, sensual curves that exude an essence of raunch and sex that was immediately reminiscent of H.R. Giger's body and sexualized alien forms. Most likely, this film was made pretty cheaply with all of the money focusing on the dazzling CG work and the rest made in front of a green screen. The future technology and spaceships used in Blood Machines are similar to stuff you've seen in other films yet still feel fresh and groundbreaking. There are so many sights and sounds that you've never seen or heard before in Blood Machines, it can only be described as intoxicating. 
The band Carpenter Brute is as much a creative force here as director Seth Eicherman is, as both seem to complement each other like clown shoes and duct tape. Eicherman's visual pulse to Carpenter Brute's molar rattling beats perfectly, transfixing the viewer and teleporting them right into the middle of space where the action takes place. I was absolutely blown away by the pairing of visual and musical innovations that I was assaulted with in Blood Machines. This is big, bold, and cinematic film candy. The story is not the deepest, though it does deal with the spiritual connection the characters have with the universe they occupy. The characters are not completely developed, but they serve their purpose to guide me through the light show. The story pairs mysticism and futurism in ways that you've seen in the best of heavy metal stories. And that's what Blood Machines should be taken as, an utterly unique experience that is the sum of many familiar parts. You just need to see it for yourselves. Do not miss this delicious feast for the senses. Witness this film on as large a screen as you can, turn the volume up past the breaking point. Blood Machines should be experienced big, bright, and loud. After rocking out to Carpenter Brute's synth ode to John Carpenter, here's another film that pays homage to the king of horror in a different way, VFW. Released on February 14th, 2020, VFW is available on demand and digital download from Voltage Pictures. VFW is directed by Joe Begos, and it's written by Max Brayler and Matthew McArdle. It's clear that horror filmmaker Joe Begos has talent, but I believe his love for the past gets in the way of him truly making a standout film. Begos really loves him some John Carpenter films. Most of his films reflect this, but while this love shines through all of his movies, I've yet to see Begos' own personality emerge, and thus his films feel like really good remakes that look, sound, and feel like a Carpenter movie, but lack a personality of their own. Begos's VFW is a standoff film, not unlike Carpenter's Assault on Precinct 13. A group of old soldiers who belly up to a bar at the VFW hall every night end up in a skirmish with a rabid group of opioid addicts from a neighboring tenement building. The title cards explain that the opioid crisis has intensified when a new drug called Hype has been introduced that basically makes the users into rabid animals. When a kid named Lizard, the vast of nights, Sierra McCormick, steals a giant load of drugs from the head dealer, Boz, Travis Hammer, she takes refuge in the VFW hall with an army of addicts behind her. This forces these old barstool warriors to stand up against these hippie whippersnappers who dare desecrate their sacred hall. It just so happens to be the birthday of bartender Fred, played by Stephen Lang, and he'll be damned if some lousy punks ruin it. Begos has assembled one hell of an awesome cast here. While they may have seen better years, it's fantastic to see Lang team up with such tough-as-nails actors as THE Fred Williamson, The Karate Kid's Martin Cove, and the always awesome William Sadler from Demon Knight. Bringing back Warriors' David Patrick Kelly and Cheers' George Went is a fantastic touch. Seeing these guys razz each other and talk shit about the good old days is a real treat. Seeing them get a chance to take part in some ultra-violence is even more fun. Each of them have had countless of memorable moments in film and TV, and Begos makes sure to give each of them their own moments to shine. Lang is solid as the lead. Sure, he can act the hell out of a villainous role, but here we get to see him fight for the good guys, and it's great to see him offer up a gruff but soulful take on the protagonist for a change. Whatever else criticism I am about to lob at VFW, seeing the cast dive into the fray one last time makes this film worth a watch. Cast and charm aside, VFW is a frustrating movie on so many technical levels. Mostly every scene is filmed inside of a dimly lit bar. The only other scenes are filmed on a muddily lit street or inside a poorly lit tenement house where the gang and the druggies live. This is a dark movie and I'm not talking about the subject matter. There are entire scenes that are filmed in almost utter darkness so much that it's difficult to know simple layouts of the area being filmed or who's doing what to whom. I understand Begos might want to pay homage to Carpenter's equally dimly lit assault on Precinct 13, but that film looked that way because at the time, that's the best Carpenter could do with the equipment he had. Modern cameras and lighting equipment, no matter how low the budget, can illuminate an area realistically so as to still convey a dark atmosphere, but it also makes figures and actions seeable. 
For some reason, Begos didn't seem to get this memo. I feel a lot of the banter between the cast of VFW might have been made up as they went along. I say that because I feel that Begos is constantly trying to catch up to the action in the scene rather than capture it. Action scenes are going on all at once, and we only see snips of dimly lit carnage. Quips and jabs are tossed about rapid fire, but sometimes, if you're not listening, you won't know who's saying what. It just feels that these scenes, even though they might have been told to ad lib, weren't set up to capture a lot of what was going down. Rudimentary establishing shots are ignored. Maybe this is because Begos only had one camera. Maybe it's just that he might have been in over his head with so many screen heroes in front of him that he didn't have it in him to make them do reshoots. Or maybe the cast was really taking shots and getting tipsy and not really complying to the game plan. Either way, there's a chaos in even the quiet scenes that make it all tough to decipher. There is some good carnage in VFW. The rampaging opioid heads' attacks are fierce, as is the retaliation from our swarthy group of heroes. Heads are explodified, limbs are hacked off. Even through the dim lighting, you can get a sense of some quality practical effects going on. Begos delivers a likable movie with VFW, but man, I really did want to love this film, and I just can't say that I did. Still, VFW is worth noting as a standout this year. That'll be it for today. Check back in tomorrow for my next pick in the countdown. Please chime in down in the comments and let me know what you think of these films, how on the nose or mind-numbingly wrong I am, or you can counter with your own darn list. If you like the video, please pound that thumbs up button. Share this video with your social media addicted pals. If you're looking for written reviews and more countdown picks, you can find them on mlmillerwrites.com. Don't forget, I have two new horror comic book trade paperbacks you should look for. Grave Transfers is out right now. And Pirouette, collecting never-before-published issues, will be out in late November, early December. Diamond order code APR201712. And be sure to subscribe to this channel, and ring that bell for alerts to be the first to see my future videos. Thank you so much for your time, and take care. Stuck inside your reality Your doom Oh, your doom Your Yeah.